So welcome uh, everybody, good morning or afternoon. Uh, my name is Francesco Michele and I'm the Strategic Analysis and Advocacy Officer in the Global Protection Cluster. Um, and I've been coordinating the review of the protection analysis updates, protection risk analysis and so on and so forth. Um, today uh, is the second webinar. We had a first webinar last Wednesday where we have been looking into the new guidance the global that we worked out the global protection cluster on the protection analysis update. So today the idea is to actually uh, have a better focus on protection risks and specifically the, the definitions that we have been developing together with the global areas of responsibility. Um, again, uh, please stop me at any time to ask questions if you have any doubts uh, or you want to actually share some reflections also from operations. Um, as you can see, we organized today's webinar in two parts. In the first part, we're going to do a very quick uh, refresher of last week's session, and then I'm going to provide a bit of an illustration on the protection risks definitions, uh, the objectives, and what are you going to find in the guidance. Then in the second part, we're going to look at practicalities. So more on how to use the protection analysis update to show the protection risks, and then a bit of examples from operation that already started applying the, the, the new guidance and start using the definitions. So, uh, please stop me at any time, even though I will have a pause each once in a while, but also after each session, if you have specific questions. Before we start, uh, is there any Initial question or something that is not clear before we jump into the, the actually the content of the webinar. Just give me some thumbs up if it's okay to start. Thank you. So uh, let's have a look a bit of a uh, couple of slides on uh, the presentation we had last week uh, on the guidance <coughs> to situate ourselves uh, for today's webinar. So last week we, we showed uh, uh, what the protection analysis update, the new guidance contains. Um, so uh, you can find all of it in the website of the Global Protection Cluster in the section of the protection analytical framework. Uh, the package includes uh, uh, two new formats for the protection analysis update, one uh, standard and one brief. Um, the logic is to have a much more flexible approach and so you can start adapting the protection analysis update to, you more, to more your needs in the operation. And the efforts that we try to do is not just to develop the format, but to develop a sample of an analysis. So it might not be perfect, but the idea is to give you already something that can inspire the, the way the analysis should be shaped into the PAU. The second guidance is the what we call protection risks explanatory notes that contains the definition and a bit how to adapt those definitions in the protection analysis updates that goes together with uh, a two pager where we actually, as we will explore today, uh, will link the protection risk analysis in the samples of the, of the PAU with the protection analytical framework. Lastly, uh, there is another tool that basically guides on the use of the format of the PAU uh, and also provides a bit of indication how to develop the content and how to include certain uh, information and management graphs and other pieces. Today, specifically, we are going to look at these two. So the protection risk explanatory note and the tutorial. So just for your reference. And last week, we actually delve more into the first two. In the refresher, let's look a bit on uh, the changes that we introduced in 2023 when it comes to protection analysis and protection analysis update. Uh, first of all, two standard, two formats, uh, one standard, one brief, which so there's already a novelty. And, uh, and the second aspect is that they are limited in pages. So we have been introducing some criteria for the publishing of the protection analysis updates, and the maximum number of pages is one of them. Because from, from your actual experience in the last year and a half, we've seen that that can really help in focus the analysis. Then when it comes to protection risks, uh, uh, we introduced the uh, identification of maximum five priority protection risks in the protection analysis update and the use and adaptation of the definition that we're going to actually look into today. 
The third area of changes in the formats is that now you have standard uh, sections, a bit more structured that can simplify actually the drafting of the protection analysis update. We introduce the publishing criteria specifically to ensure a bit of consistency and to ensure that the PAU are much more efficient when uh, we want to use them for advocacy or for other purposes. One thing that uh, is important is that as the Global Protection Cluster, we're going to publish all analysis we're going to develop in the operations. But what we're going to discuss well together uh, this year is if we want to publish them as protection analysis update, so they have to just follow some criteria and then use the language of protection risk, or as another document. In the process, the um, Global Protection Cluster and Regional Focal Point are now in charge to follow, to follow the, the processes with you and, and actually to discuss better strategically together. The overall change basically is let's try to be more strategic in the, in the use and actually the planning of the PAU. And one of the requests that we had last week was to try to plan uh, the protection analysis updates that you foresee that you're going to work for 2023. So after you have seen the guidance, so that can allow us the global protection cluster to provide you support, but even a specific session where you need them. Today, again, to focus on today, we're going to look very specifically to these two parts. So how to identify the five risks and the definitions. But also we're going to look a bit on some aspects related to the publishing criteria. To complete the refresher from last week, uh, let me let's have a quick look to the core publishing criteria. So uh, uh, there are several quality ones, uh, but those four uh, is what we're going to use with you to decide together when and how to publish the PAU. The first, we are not going to, nobody's going to check specifically, but we really uh, we will really try to push for this year, try to be as much consultative as we can with areas of responsibility, partners, constituency, and even beyond the sector if possible. Uh, what we introduced in terms of simplification was on purpose, was to ensure that the process at country level is a bit less cumbersome, so it's a bit easier because there are much more standard elements, much more structured approach. The other three criteria relates to the risks, as we say, maximum five, a bit the format requirement, and then the introduction of a standard executive summary for the protection analysis update. Again, today we're we are going to see the first two, so many of the elements we're going to discuss today serve the purpose of those two criteria specifically. So uh, again, zooming back to the guidance itself, uh, everything that we're going to discuss today is included in these two documents, uh, the Protection Risk Explanatory Note and the tutorial, where you're going to find the list of 15 protection risks, which we're going to see today, a bit of guidance on how to use them, adapt them for protection analysis update, but also generally in the context. Then uh, each definition, uh, what we try to do is to develop it as a one pager. So you can also use them uh, independently if you need to publish one or to share just one of them with the uh, for support of any, any goal you might have. Then uh, so you have also that possibility. And lastly, uh, there is a tutorial on the protection analytical framework that we actually we are going to see today together. Uh, the refresher is that part, I think it's finished. I wanted just to provide you the basics we discussed last week, and now we're going to move into the definition. But before, before I move on, uh, I let me pause a second. If there is any question, any other aspects that uh, is not clear or you would like me to, to actually explicate again. Otherwise, uh, just give me thumbs up if it's okay. So when I see some of them, I can continue. Thank you. The definition. So before entering in what the definition contains, I wanted to give you a bit of a background of the, the, the history because I we realize that sometimes you might be asked where those definitions are coming from. So uh, the Global Protection Cluster as a protection risks global tracker since March 2021. Uh, that was the original one, and he used some several concepts uh, that has been revised fully after the finalization of the protection analytical framework. So the language included in the concept matrix of the protection analytical framework has been revised because that was already discussed and agreed very widely with protection partners, including the ICRC or ACHR. 
So the idea was to actually align the language with, with, uh, with that exercise that was a consultative one. And what we've been doing uh, now, this is what we're introducing, we have been looking at the whole methodology and we are revising it completely, starting from the definition, but also start also developing criteria for severity. The second element uh, from the background is that normally we use the protection risks uh, tracker and all the information you develop on protection risk for the um, global protection updates that are published quarterly and they have been they have become sort of the flagship documents for, for our advocacy and communication. It's what, the, what our donors and, and, and specific actors come back to us to, to actually be engaged after the publication. So we really use the protection risk and the bold protection risk in the tracker and in the updates for uh, engagement with donors. The third element uh, relates to what you know, the protection analysis updates. And all this exercise, all the new guidance that we are rolling out now comes from a lessons learned exercise that we have been doing the last three, four months that looked back at all the professionalized update that has been produced by operations since April 2021 to December 2022. We looked at around 45 to 50 protection analysis update. And um, most of the guidance actually come from uh, practice that you in the operation has been up, has been uh, actually developing for for the for those updates. What we change in the PAU specifically for 2023 uh, is a much more consistent approach on protection risks. That's sort of the major change. And the goal, what we're going to see now, is to be much more systematic in advocacy to have a better language, a language that can really support our efforts with humanitarian country team, with humanitarian coordinators, so on and so forth. The, the idea of working together on the protection risks and having a much more solid approach was discussed between the Global Protection Cluster and the whole area of responsibility at global level with three core objectives in mind. One is to ensure consistency across us, across all the area of responsibility and the protection cluster, but also across the sector overall. And then uh, the, the main goal is to start using the analysis, showing the analysis uh, to present a common voice, a common positioning, uh, a common sector position. Because the protection sector is really wide. We have many expertises uh, between the areas of responsibility, but also partners. We do many, many, many types of actions. So sometimes it's, we, we are not able to show this unique approach. So the idea is to use the protection risk for that purpose. And of course, the goal, as said, is to better engage externally. So donors, duty better your leadership, but also some, it's also internally by focusing a bit the approach on, on core outcomes on, on the risks that can help in actually looking better at our operations, the recommendation, and et cetera. For the use, uh, I'm repeating, we use the Global Protection Day, the PAUs, but also for advocacy messages, brief, reports, and donor, and donor briefing. Sometimes we have opportunities at global level um, and uh, of course, we are in constant communication with you in the operation, but sometimes we just use the analysis you produce automatically for certain engagement. In terms of the process, because there might be another question that you have been asked, how did we develop the definitions? So we spent uh, since October, even September, then we, there was the initial steps of uh, having two to three rounds of consultation feedback uh, uh, with working group task team with the Global Protection Cluster, but with all AOS since the very onset. So we even discussed what is the best way of presenting the definition, what is the best way to develop the guidance, even before starting developing the definition themselves. One of the core aspects that we try to ensure, and some of you have been involved, is to test uh, whatever we were developing together at global level with some operations. So also to give a, a, a reality check. So whether we were going in a, in a good direction or we were developing elements that might not be applicable. So this just to give you some, uh, some uh, confidence when you're going to describe maybe to partner, constituency, another actor where the definition is coming from. Now let's go into the standard definitions. Um, if there is any question of this per first part, please stop me, yeah? because now we're going to move into the definition themselves. So the standard definition of protection risk is what you have in the protection analytical framework, which is that is written there. A protection risk is the actual 
or potential exposure of the affected population to violence, coercion, and deliberate deprivation. In doing this exercise, I mean, also building on the lessons learned from the protection ethical framework, we realize there are two elements that are quite complicated when it comes to information data monitoring or doing analysis, which are the fact the definition includes both actual or potential, which require two different approaches. And, uh, and also, it's difficult to present both elements at the same time. But also, it's a bit of a challenge. I think as a sector, we have been challenged sometimes because it's not been very strongly clear whether we refer to current risks, to potential risks, and so on and so forth. The second element relates to violence, coercion, and deliberate deprivation, which are three concepts that also are very general, let's say, and are not easy to be shown and to be reflected in monitoring and in the analysis. So for this purpose, in the guidance that you're going to find, we introduce, we of course, we make always reference to the standard definition, but we introduce a bit of an operational approach that we can use for the protection analysis uh, starting this year. The operational approach, what looks into is, let's focus first and foremost in our analysis to the current or the actual protection risk. So what do we have in, in terms of information, knowledge and data that can we can use to showcase what protection risks are impacting the population now. Then many of you are quite advanced, so it's good to present an analysis also of the of the what is coming or now the, what is the potential protection risks. But we realize that let's start to solidify well our analysis of the current situation. When we look at the current situation, we we develop these three elements for a definition. They are the same one that we use for each single definitions that you're going to see in the protection risk. So basically, we look at the protection when we look at the protection risks, we um, look at the intensity and damage or harm resulting from a human activity or a product of human activity affecting, of course, either individuals or groups. So for protection risk for us are not completely dependent on the amount of population involved, but some protection risks are very severe even if they address very few groups uh, of few or a small group of population. There are two in this, uh, even uh, we try to be quite concrete, but still the concept of harm in protection is quite a broad concept because it includes both physical and mental integrity, material safety and violation of rights. And at the same time, human activity, so which relates to the responsibility of the authorities, the perpetrators, or the actors that hold responsibilities. It's not an easy concept because sometimes it's due to purposeful action. So some actor they do on purpose those violations of those acts that actually cause protection risks. But sometimes might be what is called uh, in normatively by omission. So by not acting, in, uh, to mitigate or to stop, they are actually not complying with their responsibility. So these two elements is just to say that this require our analysis, not just to use data. So not just to use available data, but also to use your knowledge expertise or the knowledge and expertise of our partner constituency, local colleagues and so on, because that's what's really what helps clarifying what harm and other aspects right, related to human activity. So this is the first, what is important about this, you're going to see it in the guidance, is just that the definition has been developed with these elements on, on in mind. So they are trying to be a bit more operational and not to be an over-encompassing definitions that can be used even uh, beyond, beyond the set. Is there any question? We're going to look into now the definition of what you're going to see into that. So the standards definition that we developed uh, are organized in three paragraphs. Now I'm going to tell you what you, you find inside. But then we have been doing a parallel exercise with a colleague of OECHR in order to develop for each risk, for each of the 15 risks, certain element to reinforce our human rights engagement. We realize that oftentimes it's a matter of language and concept, and sometimes it's a matter of not understanding a bit how to use the analysis. So the goal is to have an additional guidance that will guide us on how to engage with human rights. As you can see, we're still working on it and we plan 
if everything goes well, to have it ready by the second quarter of 2023. In meanwhile, we have the exercise. So if any of you need specific human rights consideration, please come back to us because we already have the work ongoing with OECHR. The three paragraphs. Uh, the first one describes very simply what acts, events or situation constitute the protection risk. So what you can see there present. The second looks a bit more on uh, when we are going to analyze, identify, analyze and monitor those protection risks, what factors we have to consider. So one thing is the event and the situation that we can, uh, some of them are, can be related to specific data, but then there are some factors as we were discussing in the, in the previous slide that might be uh, reflected upon. So here in the second part of each uh, definition, you're going to see a bit of an illustration of what factors you can take into consideration. Thirdly, in the last paragraph of each definition, you have an illustration of what data information can be used. Now we're going to see specifically in the details, but we did this on purpose in order to maybe simplify of, uh, the relation between the colleagues that actually draft the analysis and the colleagues from the IA information and management side. Uh, so there can be an elements of connection whereby this, this initial illustration that we give can, can guide all your processes when you go uh, and, and do a protection risk analysis. So I will not enter in, in reading the full definition, but I wanted to show you a bit of an example of what you might expect. So here uh, is the related to the, the, the risk of denial of resources and opportunities. As you can see, each paragraph basically it's more or less the same phrasing. This protection risk includes, and in this case, acts that deprive or preempt people to rightful access to economic resource access, livelihood opportunities, etc. But then, since some protection risks uh, involve many different types of violation or, or, or threats, what we did sometimes is to actually provide a clear definition of each of any elements. So in this case, the whole risk includes discrimination, stigma denial of resource opportunities and denial of humanitarian access. When that is happening, you're going to have a definition of each single one of them. When it comes to the second paragraph, as you can see here, the monitoring of this protection risk requires, and then it provides an illustration of what is interesting to look at in order to monitor these protection risks. And then what we try to do specific for some specific risks is to give you some elements on what to look at in situation of a conflict or in situation of a natural hazard, let's say, so where there is no armed conflict, because some protection risks have a different connotation, so and also mechanisms. And so when it's when we manage, given the short paragraph that we want to maintain, we just gave an illustration of those two types of crises. And then lastly, uh, I think what is interesting in the last paragraph which definition is that we did an effort to provide an illustration of data and information from other sectors, not specifically the protection that can help us in actually developing the analysis. So even in your engagement with other sectors, with other actors, maybe this can help you out in being more focused because it's not easy to engage all actors, all clusters, and also from the lessons learned that we had, sometimes you really need the buy-in of the other sector. So here also can be an element that can help you out in the process of engaging other sectors and other partners. So to conclude on this side, each definition is organized with these three paragraphs, and then there is the final list of definition, which is this one. In this list, uh, is, uh, many of you know it already because it's been used since last year, but as you can see, I highlighted uh, some words in red, and those are specific changes in language that we agreed upon with the areas of responsibilities. Uh, either to align the protection risk with a specific concept or terminology that is used by the areas of responsibility specifically, or to align together with language that can really help us out in, in linking with other systems related to that specific dimension of risks. So the work of consultation and drafting uh, in terms of the results are a revised list with the revised terminology that is much more coherent across the sector, but also the specific definition with the, with the structure that I've been showing you so far. So when it comes to definition, this is uh, the part I wanted to present. So we did a process of consultation. We, you are going to have the, you have the list, but you have also the definition. And then for the second quarter, we're going to work more on the human rights uh, engagement side. 
Now uh, we finalized the first part, so I will make a pause. Uh, and I would like to hear a bit from you if you have any questions, doubts, or even challenges that you found uh, in applying some of these or uh, in general on protection risks. So let me pause there and don't be shy. Please raise your hand or ask the question directly or in the chat. Thank you. Is anything clear so far? In case, just give me a thumbs up if. Uh, Thank you, Kiberly. Francesco, ¿esa es una lista definitiva y cerrada o es una lista que, que está eh, sujeta a alguna apertura? Gracias, Jorge. Um, I'm going to answer to Jorge in Spanish and then I'm going to translate. Jorge asks if this list is closed or if uh, it's open and it can be modified. Uh, la idea, Jorge, es que por el momento está cerrada, que la vayamos utilizando para el 2023 y la idea es a final de año con vuestra experiencia, revisar e identificar si falta algo, si hay que cambiar cosas o si está bien así. Entonces, para este año, para el uso de este año, sí, y se va a revisar a finales de año. No sé si te, te parece bien la respuesta o si necesitas algún otro detalle. It's clear, thanks. So, uh, the, the, the answer on the... Thank you, Jorge, for the question. Um, the list, uh, it's closed as now, is agreed with the OEORs. But one of the ideas that we had is let's start using it for 2023, so all the year, and we are going to run a revision by the end of the year. So the idea is that we learn from the experience. So we could spend months in defining a, 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 a list that is not coming from practice. So let's start using it, and we are going to collect lessons learned all over the year in order to decide at the end of the year whether it's a good list or whether to revise it and so on and so forth. Thank you, Jorge. Is there any other question or doubt on this part? I'm just pausing a bit more because the second part we're going to enter in a much more detailed uh, presentation. Is it okay to continue? Can I ask some uh, thumbs up again? Just to be sure because I don't see cameras. Thank you. So in this second part, now we look a bit of the theory and the process. In the second part, the idea is to look a bit on, OK, how do we do the professionalized update and how we can uh, actually go in practice? So I will show you the format and how to play with the format and work with the format, but also some uh, examples on how to identify, how to use data and information and how to prioritize protection risks. So when it comes to the protection analysis update, uh, this is a, we use it also last week, so apologies for the colleagues that were there also in uh, last week. There is a section, uh, there is a mistake, it's not three pages, it's six pages, the maximum, which is the section where to draft the narrative analysis of protection risks. The idea is to focus on the five most prominent protection risks in the period. So try to use the list that we provide, the definitions. Oh, yeah, there is a, now we are going to look at how to adapt them to the context. And, and then what we have seen from practice that work very well is to have the buy-in. So to do really do a collective process. Instead of defining ourselves, but in doing a proactive process, sometimes it results a bit easier than, uh, than what it seems, specifically when there are categories or standards and so on. So the goal is that the protectionalist update should use as a reference the 50 standard, but the way you draft in the protectionalist update, you have full flexibility to adapt them to the context. And for that, we provided in the guidance uh, some uh, uh, suggestions, some hints, in order to ensure that the language of risk is coherent, even if you adapt them in the context. The first element is when you draft the headings of the risk, Try to avoid general formulation uh, like all forms of violence. That doesn't really help in uh, clarifying what risk we're talking about. So it's something more for the context. So make sure that you're a bit more precise. Or even uh, and that it's happened when we speak about house, land, and properties, that doesn't help in understanding what are the particular risk or the particular situation in terms of house, land, and property that we are trying to highlight. So try just to avoid those general formulations. And when you redraft or when you adapt, consider that risk, it, 
it's, it's always related to a form of uh, violence, coercion, deliberate deprivation done by actors. So try to qualify it. So use like language like force, denial, impediment, something that actually qualify what is the role of the, I would say, the possible perpetrator of the, of the authorities or of the, the responsible parties of that. The third element is that there might be crises where you are in there, where the major crisis or the major issues in the humanitarian crisis is something pertaining to another set. Food security is what comes to mind, for instance, uh, that actually is a dominating the whole humanitarian narrative. So it's a priority for every, a sector, it's a specific priority for the whole humanitarian action. In those cases, what we, the guidance, what you will see is suggest to actually highlight very well the risk or the risks that interrelate with that situation. So if it's food security, for instance, introduce those risks that are driver or do the risk that it's a driver of, of food security or it's creating the cycle of food insecurity or potential risks that actually are exacerbated or are increased in, in terms of impact due to food insecurity, for instance, if we speak about food security and insecurity. We did, we did a similar exercise now with Somalia, for instance, where we have been looking into uh, the risk of denial of resource and opportunity specifically for a marginalized group as one of the drivers of food security. And we actually focus the analysis on that. The last point, it relates with the first, but uh, it's even more, it's to avoid even more general context. So occupation, uh, ongoing violence and conflict. And some of the colleagues here, uh, they know that in the context, sometimes we use this language, but try really to focus on what is the protection risk that is resulting from, from the general situation. Everything clear so far? Please stop me, yeah? Because now we, one of the efforts that we try to do also in the guidance is to link and to try to give you some sense on how to use the protection analytical framework and the protection analysis update. So the, the, the message is very simple. The protection analytical framework should give you the logic. So in presenting the risk, let's follow the logic threats the effects of the threat and the capacity. So even in the narrative, and you will find it in the sample of the protection analysis update, try to just use that, 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 that narrative. So start with the threats, look at the effects that you are identifying using all the data information available, and then going into capacity. An element that is fundamental is that the protection, our protection risk analysis, even when we use it, uh, it's stronger if we link up data and information uh, that shows driver causes and effects also of other sectors. So that's just an invitation and that's also coming from the protection analytical framework. So are, those are the two major elements that can inspire the protection analysis update. Now, when it comes to the protection analysis update itself, the, the, what we suggest is not to be um, mixed up in the format, but use the format to better present the protection risk. So use the context, the protection risk section in the response to showcase all the analysis that you can do following the protection analytical framework, if it's the case. The part of the context, you can actually fill in the context, but what I mean here is that there is no need of doing a wide context analysis. Once you've been prioritized the risk, I think that document and provide a context analysis on your countries, on your crisis, there are many. So we can really, 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 really focus on either the geographic area or on specific elements that are important for us to highlight uh, to show the impact of protection risks or the magnitude. So even when we look at past occurrences or trends, or if there are specific situations on a political or socioeconomic level that are changing something in the situation of the population, or even when we look at uh, laws uh, or, or cultural or social norms, there is no need of describing all of them, but just focus on the ones that are important to keep an eye on that, to understand the protection risk uh, and that are going to present it afterwards in the section of protection risks. The core analysis of the logic, so threats, effects, and capacity, it's uh, the protection risk section. So here is where you can really uh, outline well the, the logic of it. But then in the response section, uh, if you have seen uh, uh, from last webinar, there has been a bit of change in the format because you have very good dashboards on four or five Ws, on uh, response, uh, on funding. We, we have been 
realizing that those it's good to use autonomously and use the protection analysis update actually to reinforce what you have there. So here there is no need of replicating the dashboard, but really focusing on uh, even qualitative aspect that you want to highlight on specific geographic areas, on the challenges to our response capacity or situation that are specifically related to our response capacity, to the sector response capacity, sorry, and uh, uh, can be of any kind, so specific factors and so on. So here, Again, if uh, you use uh, as a reference the, the, the guiding question of the protection analytical framework, this can also guide you in understanding what we could actually highlight in the context session. Now, um, what we try to do as well, again, to link in the protection analytical framework and the protection analysis update is to, you're gonna have a two pager with the same analysis that you have in the, in the format, where we actually tag, as you can see here in the example, each paragraph to a section of the path. What is the logic of this? Sometimes you, uh, what you see that some of you are focused on the drafting of the narrative analysis, and then we have the colleagues on the IAM side that you are a huge work to organize the data for us. It's not easy to, to, to actually have those matching. So this document is it's done on purpose to on one side, I see how to structure the analysis, but also they can provide an indication to our IAM colleagues on how to structure the data and information for you. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole example, but I wanted to just uh, do a quick drive through. Uh, so when you go to the to the document, it's easy for you to understand what is in there. So as you can see here, the, the, the example are coming from the sample of the PAU that you're going to see. So in the first paragraph, in order to illustrate the threats, so the risk here is attacks, attacks and violations. So here we say, according to the national system that, that is monitoring incidents uh, or people killed, injured, and kidnapped, these are the numbers. And this is the trends or the variation according to the previous period. A simple paragraph that is actually highlighting very quickly what is the threat about. Then uh, uh, providing a bit the situation for the population in terms of demography, locations, uh, they can either focus on highlight vulnerabilities, why specific populations are extremely vulnerable, not just that they are victim, but why they have specific situation. Maybe they are displaced population or they have particular conditions. So there are certain groups that are much more vulnerable than others to certain situation. And also a bit of more of the disaggregation. If we don't have it for the whole country, at least focusing in those areas where it's important to focus. So even using the PAU to actually have a zoom in or a specific area and provide a good update. When it comes to capacity, we have seen that generally we have the tendency to show our 4 5 w what do we do. Uh, but I mean, the analysis will be, it's good also to start using, even if it's qualitative and it's coming from the knowledge and expertise of our partner, our constituency or the AUR, a bit of understanding first what is happening at local level, what is actually mitigating uh, the situation of risk. So here you can see an example. And what is good of the example is two elements. One is that it focuses on just some, some areas. So as you can see here, to mitigate the violence in these four regions, Atepo, Tisura, Piro, and Sausalia, the governor, so not the humanitarian response or the protection response, has been trying to do this. In this case, deploy peaceful coexistence committees. But then also it qualified unsuccessfully. So it's to show, sometimes you might also have data for this, but sometimes it's just an issue, okay, our response is doing that, but at local level there are this and this other mechanism, and maybe sometimes you can highlight a mechanism that are working well in one area to actually promote that in the recommendation that can be extended to other areas. When it comes to response, so international humanitarian response, uh, beside the data and so on, it's good sometimes here, for instance, in the example, we introduce a trend that we have a, with some data. So we have data and we show the trend. But then here we are linking up with, uh, for instance, the decision of the Security Council to renew the mandate of a specific UN mission. In this case, it's a fake one. And then we qualify what, what this is, how this actually is impacting the risk. Okay. So as you can see, we write may, may have positive effect on the level of violence. So Sometimes we might not have the hard data to showcase, but I think as a protection sector and protection partner, we have a good understanding and we can use the PAU to showcase that. So using more the qualitative side of the data and information as well. Lastly, 
uh, some, even when it comes to capacity, it's good to focus on what in the protection analytical framework or deterrence. So elements that actually are having an impact in the either in determining the, the, the perpetrators or to actually put a stop or mitigating the risks. So in this case, again, I, uh, in, the, in the sample, we introduce an improvement that we have seen with some data. And then we say, however, this improvement is not expected for the next semester since, uh, and there is a situation. In this specific sample, for instance, is the application of a new law. So we introduce the law, we introduce uh, some numbers uh, and some improvement that the law introduces. But then in our analysis for the period, we can't qualify, we don't see the application of this law on the ground in changing the impact for the population now, or we don't see it unless this and this happen. So this was just an idea to showcase to you a bit on the narrative of the analysis, how to organize it. So it is it, it, the only goal is that, not to completely copy paste this one. So you have full freedom of developing the analysis that makes, that is relevant to you, but maybe, using the rationale of the path in terms of logic and a bit these elements can help you out and simplify even the engagement of other actors when you go and draft the protection analysis update. Now in the next slide I wanted to show you how to interrelate section but again as usual let me pause for one second if there is any question or doubts on this part. Otherwise a quick thumbs up uh, round again. So I'm sure that I'm not going too fast or I'm, I'm being clear. Thank you. So when it comes to the protection analysis update, uh, the old document, you can really use flexibly the old document to present your analysis. So not just the protection of this section, you know, so don't be scared about the limitation in pages uh, because uh, you have I mean, first the executive summary, where we provide the list of the identified protection risk. And here the goal is really just to provide the list. Reason being, uh, because by seeing the list, then people is invited to go and look at the analysis. So no provide, and if we introduce some elements here, some of them might stop just on the first page. So this is to invite them to read actually the protection risk section. Then the context, and then let me share with you some experiences of some operations, is it's a, it's a session where not only we can introduce context element, but also if, for instance, instead of prioritizing five risks, in your discussion with the constituency, the AUR, you prioritize seven, uh, and you don't have, and we have to leave it on the five on the protection risk section, you can use the context to introduce some risks, because some risk, of course, all the, inter the risks normally interrelate. So the ones that are much more contextual, you can use also the context session to describe uh, part of the risk that you've identified. I make you an example, which is related again, for instance, to the interrelation between sometimes attacks and displacement. Um, you might have a need or an interest even for, 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 for the narrative that you have in the country to maybe present displacement or the elements of displacement as a risk, because for you it's a fundamental risk. Then you could, instead of introducing also the risk of attacks, you can explain with data and information and so on, all the situation of, atta of attacks in the context section, section, acting as a driver of one of the protection risks that you have identified, in this case, displacement. It can be even the other way around. For you, it's extremely important to put the focus on the attacks because it's extremely relevant in your engagement with humanitarian country team and humanitarian community, but maybe the displacement situation is a general driver for many of the risks. So you could introduce the old data on general displacement and so in the context section. So it's really flexible and adaptable to the way you want to present the narrative in terms of analysis. Then when it comes to response, we already discussed that a bit. Uh, try to use that section not to present just data on response, but to qualify those elements that are very that are good to understand elements of capacity that are missing. So since they are missing, the risks are impacting much more the population. Or maybe some capacity that sometimes are positive. In this and this region, we have this capacity and actually we are able to have a better situation or a better response or a better mitigation. Because then can really reinforce the recommendations. Because the recommendation might also be what we are already doing in one area, our recommendation to extend it to other areas, for instance. 
And when it comes to recommendation section, uh, this is the, the structure is it's a bit strict. So to present the recommendation by risks. And that is a that has two general goals, I would say. One is is again it makes your narrative stronger because you are presenting analysis and a recommendation to address the problem. So the analysis presents the problem and the recommendation addresses specifically the problem. And also it shows the whole integrated approach that we have as a sector. So all the AOR responses, all the partners, actors that you have in your constituency, uh, we show all our recommendation to a specific risks. Uh, so not not specific area of response only, and that can even be used more with humanitarian coordinated humanitarian country team for follow up uh, of with other sector as well for follow up uh, on the recommendation. So again, the idea of this part was to just share the message with everyone, not to be scared about the format, but try to use all the elements of the format so you have wide and ample flexibility to really shape the analysis at the best you want. So. The, the idea of the categories are just for us as a sector to organize a better our general systematic approach. But when it comes to the shaping of the protectionist update, it should be the format that serves your purposes and not the other way around. So don't try just to fix, just use the fixed elements, but then the narrative you can really shape in different ways to present your protection risk analysis. Before I delve into practice, this from operation um, any I will pause again for a quick round of reflection again if you have any or maybe the colleagues that already tried some of these if you have any comment reflection challenge so, so maybe I can share a bit my experience because we already yeah. use this format for yeah. our bow that was published um, on January um on my end it was i feel like it was a bit challenging just to identify five main protection risks considering the situation in venezuela and also at the same time double think okay what has been going on what's recent what's new regarding mm -hmm. these risks so that was a bit challenging and also considering um, I'm sorry to Blair, this is an open and safe place, but also what to say and what not to say, because that's yeah. very delicate when you have um, relations relations with the government, etc. So it was smooth the experience of having this 15 protection risk and seeing what applies, what doesn't apply. But at the same time, I felt, OK, I need more than five, you know, um, maybe also um, I needed more guidance on how to um, mention this sub protection risks. Let's say not make them eight, but choose main five and leave the other three in a different context uh, as sub protection risks. So I don't know if you can give us guidance on how to allocate this sub protection risks better. Um, yeah, but other than that, I feel like it was it, this format was way more structured. Uh, and uh, gave me more guidance and actually like knowing, OK, this is what I need to include. This is not that relevant and avoiding like very big context analysis that are extremely wide. Um, th in the previous one, we were mentioning things that already happened the year before. So this mm -hmm. year was a bit more practical. So uh, it was really smooth and a nice experience, except the fact of actually choosing the five protection risks. Thank you, Kibani. No, that's, uh, that's good to hear. Uh, I'm going to present an example on uh, how to go about the choosing and the prioritization. So after the example, maybe Kimberly, you can come back to see whether the example might could have been useful for, for your specific situation. Now, uh, we know that it's going to be challenging to identify priority protection risks. Uh, uh, I've been following several operations, and some of them has been quite straightforward. Actually, the idea of actually prioritizing has been helpful because it helped my partner to get together and also with the AOS. In some others, it's been challenging. So the two general messages, and now we're going to look at a couple of examples, are use the different power formats to, to have a narrative all along the year. So if, for instance, the PAU you publish now, you focus on five, maybe you can publish a brief protection analysis update, which is maximum six pages, and it's easy to be developed, to put a focus on another one or to focus in two months uh, on uh, one risk that you didn't involve in the five. So you can play along with the, the PAUs uh, 
Uh, that was, was one of the goal of having the two formats. Uh, so they can the brief one you can use it for zooming in in one specific risk or or or, or, or so on and so forth. Um, and then as we are going to see the example, the suggestion that we have is that even if we in the PAU we shape just five, don't focus analysis only on prioritize five. Okay, so no, the, the joint analysis session should not be geared only to prioritize five, but to have a broader prioritization, because as we're going to see in the example, maybe under one risk, you can present two situations, you know? So the idea of putting them as just priority is not to hide others, but to show more the correlations. So if uh, you have, uh, again, attacks and displacement, maybe they can be put together in the narrative. So the, the risk is attacks, but then you really focus on the displacement effects and so on and so forth. We realize that it's not so much about what we put in the top priority, but it's the analysis that is strong. So I know I know that I'm not providing an answer, Kimberly, so thanks for that. But maybe one after we see the example, maybe we can go back to see, to have a bit of your reflection, if it's OK. And thank you for, for, for the intervention. Is there any other reflection? I know that many of it will come from practice, but uh, just let me know if uh, there are uh, some elements that are not fully clear. OK, let me go to then uh, showcasing the example and then we can pause after each example and just to give a bit of uh, your perspective on how do you see that. So uh, again, these are examples, so there are no guidance or suggestion on how to go about it, just example of practice from actually some of you, uh, some of the ratios. Um, in one of the, actually in a couple of operations, the way they went about them is uh, um, the first is a general comment. You already have no, you already have all the information, data, and knowledge. So it's not that the protection risk should push you to rechange completely. Um, the only fact that changes is that sometimes you have analysis, or we have analysis or data and so on that we frame just differently. In some context, concern, issues, needs, violations, or are part of our protection strategy. So though what is important to reflect, we know normally the context. But maybe it's not phrases of protection risks. So what they've been doing in this specific uh, uh, example is that they took the whole list of concern uh, problems that has been identified on by the protection sector, either in the strategy or in other documents. Uh, they looked into the 15 standard risks. And then what they've been trying to do is to see how do what I don't know, there's several points interrelate with the, to the risks. I was in one of those exercises and the initial list of agreed problems, it was around 22 problematics. And then in the exercise, they managed actually to organize them under seven top risks. Okay, so the idea is sort of rationalizing something that you already have under, um, you know, one, um, let's say that which is the core impact of many problematic or it can be the, the main drive. Then what is important after that and what has been done is that maybe the language of the risk as it is, is not helpful or maybe as Kimberly say, it cannot be used in the country. So of course then you can redraft or adapt the language of the risks according to what you need in the country. So it might be, it might be several, uh, several elements about that. But let's look uh, concretely uh, with an example. So the assent this is coming from a, an operation that actually tried to do, to do the exercise. So what they was clear in the operation is that these elements is what they've been advocating for. So safety and security, there are ongoing attacks and general violation of human rights, constantly basically almost in all territory. That's specifically the area where there are displaced, displaced population and the majority of the attacks, uh, there is a constant violation of the civilian humanitarian character of sites, uh, putting at risk the population. Then there is a widespread uh, contamination of explosive ordnance, and then there are all, almost all violations of child protection, so the core, almost six uh, core type of violations uh, as a general problematics. They look at the risks, uh, and they identify among different risks uh, that they want to be put on up front is the attacks on civilian and other unlawful killings. Um, so decided not to even put it in the context, but to put it as a risk because it was fundamental for them to put the accent 
on that risk as something that actually is impacting the overboard on the population. Then, if we look at the, at the elements of all, they realized that in, during the joint session, in the reflection with partners, with DAOs, and with colleagues, uh, that attacks and disregards of human rights are the major threat. So, are the core violation that actually is causing or is having an effect on many other aspects. In terms of effects, they realized that explosive water and contamination is a specific effect, specifically in those areas where there, is, there has been attacks in the latest period. Um, or there are ongoing attacks, so we cannot do the mining action or we cannot do activities, so the risk is still higher in, that, in those areas. And, uh, and as well, related to the no respect of sites and, and civilians, let alone injuries and, and, and death and so on and so forth. So as you realize, what before was presented as different elements in the risk has been used for the narrative. So the, the attacks and with data and information on the attacks, and then the data on the, the explosive water and contamination is uh, relate, related to the to actually exacerbating the impact on certain area of attacks, and also all this, the part of the not respecting the sites and the, the humanitarian character of sites. When it comes to child protection, that has been streamlined in the narrative because some elements of child protection were effects. So, for instance, the association of children with uh, armed groups. So that was something that was put as a so sort of in the narrative. I mean, in the narrative, we don't write effects, capacity, and so on. But in the logic, uh, specifically in the area where there is an increase of attacks uh, and, and, and an increased presence of armed groups, uh, there was an increase of uh, association of children with armed forces. But then the all uh, the old data on child separation was presented as actually it was a coping capacity for this certain area because family were sending away children. Uh, in order to protect them from the attacks and from the audience insecurity and safety in just two or three regions. So for the specific update has been shown that there is an increase of child separation as a, as a sort of coping capacity, but still showing why all the elements interrelate. When they've been doing this exercise and they've been looking into how to link up all the elements, they realized that the wording of the risk was not fully appropriate. So then they, they, they revised the language as leaving attacks on civilian and civil object, but putting the accent, so a focus on disregarding the humanitarian character of sites, because that is something that is, was extremely relevant in terms of advocacy in general, even for the humanitarian coordinator. So it was fundamental to link it up and also to showcase uh, uh, all the, the, the factors that are important for, for that risk. Let me stop here. Uh, Kimberly, this is the, one of the examples I was mentioning. I don't know if Maybe you did something similar or, or this is not applicable in Venezuela or is not even an answer to the challenge you have. But if you have any reflection, it would be great. Yes, thank you, Francesco. It really helped. Yeah, yeah, I uh -huh. definitely I saw it clearer. Thank you. Okay, and good. I basically we did something very similar also. Ah, OK. Yeah, the idea is not to reinvent the wheel. Try to really think better how the, all the things interrelate. And I, we, I've been in the field, as you and we normally do this. The problem is that when we present the analysis, we have different ways of presenting. So the idea is to really use the risk uh, more as a reflection and strategic exercise for us. Uh, so use the definition just for that purpose and to simplify a bit the processes. Any question or doubts before I move to the next example? So the next example, again, is an example, eh? so don't take it as a, as a specific guidance, but uh, again, this is practice from some uh, operations. Um, in this example specifically, they have been looking into uh, how to use the protection risk and the path to organize data and information. So the first thing, uh, what they've been trying to do is to use the categories of the protection analytical framework, so pillars, sub pillars, and so on, to do a joint analysis, a joint session with uh, with the partner of the of the of the cluster in order to just assessing what information is needed, where the information is, and what who what can be the sources. But in correspondence to threats, effects, and capacity and the subcategories. So that really guides them in rationalizing how to use different types of information. Then the second, sorry, I'm losing the presentation. 
The second uh, part, the second exercise that we're doing is to revise the dashboard that we're using uh, to showcase the data. In this case, specifically for the protection monitoring. So instead of presenting a dashboard with, uh, with uh, all the data protection monitoring, maybe organized by the section of the questionnaire or by other section, they organize in the presentation along the categories of the path. So threats, vulnerability, capacity, and the subcategories. So that helped in having all the actors that were contributing to analysis is actually looking at the data with the same logic. So now with the, now with the logic of their own area of responsibility, but more the logic on the, on the sequence of threats, effects, and capacities. And that streamlined and was it made a bit simpler the drafting of the protection analysis update. The major change being in the first protection analysis update, they divided the section and they asked specific area of responsibility and specific partner just to draft those sections. After this exercise, uh, they've been drafting the protection analysis update much, much more simpler because there was a sort of agreement on the data to be used. And then all the UR and your partner contributed to the different sections. To show you to be very simply visually one of the part of the exercise they've been doing, these are specific sections of the protection monitoring they have in place. So on household demographic and vulnerability, displacement history, history, intention and return condition and safety. And they have been basically mapping them out on the question and the data presented in, uh, in the questionnaire, what type of area of the path was contributing to. So, and we will see another example in the next slide. So let me look at this. So as you can see here in the, the middle column, you have specific question of the protection monitoring. So for instance, if displaced, what was the cause of your displacement? If the household intends to move, why does your household wants to move? And then they have certain uh, a set of options for safety and so on and so forth. So what they've been doing is to reflect internally which data of the protection monitoring can help in understanding the risk or the different part of the risk as the definition we've seen. So which data can help in understanding the intensity and, the, and damage? which data can be helpful in understanding the relation with perpetrators, the TPN and, 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 and authorities. And also if the, the threats is affecting specific groups or the whole area and, and so on and so forth. And then uh, the, the, the table you've seen before, they use the questionnaire, the questionnaire organized by the path just to organize the data information. So take this as a, with a grain of salt, but uh, it was an exercise they tried to do so not to actually have this long, 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 long process of consultation and discussion, what should go into the analysis, but starting already from pulling together some data, but organizing already the logic that then has been used for the protection risk in the PAUs. Let me pause again for a minute. Is there anything that uh, sounds familiar or you'll be doing something similar? Again, to come back to you a bit. So let me go to the last example. The prioritization. Again, uh, I think it really relates a lot with, uh, with your comments. Um, but this is another example. So what they, the way they've been doing uh, in another operation is to, of course, you look at the analysis they already have. And first, uh, internally, so cluster coordinator, co-coordinator, and a small group without opening for, for uh, a wide consultation, they look at the list and they start to draft a broader list, more or less with the first, like the first example. So a broad list uh, on how those risks and all everything they already had and discussed with partners and UIs on can fit in those lists, uh, um, as exactly as the first example. Then they, they did a small consultation specifically with uh, those AUR or those partners that, are, that have been already engaged in the analysis. So specific actor, a small group that is actually being contributing very actively to the analysis, just to have a sense checking and revised and the list and so on. And after that, they've been organizing joint analysis sessions, uh, either subnational or national, to actually bring together the, the initial risk identified and how do they interrelate with what was already discussed in past exercises and do a workshop type of exercise where to prioritize a broad list. So the prioritization didn't focus on in five, but focus on more than five, so six, seven, eight, I might not recall specifically. 
So when they went then to draft the professionalism update, uh, they tried to actually draft everything to reflect the seven and the eight risks, but included in the file in the section of the protection risks, the core file, and then using the other risks uh, either to draft a bit better the context or to interrelate uh, into, as we have been discussing so far, uh, on the different risks, uh, again using the, the logic of the path. So uh, this is another way of going about it. Uh, in order not to have a cumbersome, long uh, process of agreeing, uh, disagreeing on what to include in the analysis. Uh, because even if the potential risk definition might be a bit new, uh, the, you already have ongoing processes and discussion with partner, at least is the experience of what we have seen in, uh, in following some of the operations. That's it on that side. So you can see that can be used very flexibly. So even in the use of the of the language and so on, and the way you, you can use it. The goal of today's session was to give you a bit more of confidence to you in the way you're going to engage partners, say you are, and so on. So the two core messages is that, first of all, we, just, we, we work together with the global AURs. That's one. But the other is that there is really an effort everywhere in the old guidance and in the new formats to reflect everything we do. So there is no, even if we're trying to be more structured, but again, to be a, a bit of flexibility. On my side, let me pause there. Uh, and it would be good if to have a bit of sense checking. If there is anything that is not clear, you want to me go back to, or all is clear so far? Thank you. So if there is no, I understand that uh, while you're going to start and applying them, uh, probably the question will uh, search. Um, we are absolutely available all the time. And then in, in the closure, I will tell you the next steps a bit on our side. Um, but again, the, the, the goal of the definition and to go about protection risk is let's try to get it to be more focused on protection risks. Don't be stopped if you have any challenge. Let's discuss together because we can have a very you know, we can have a process. The idea is not to do everything perfect uh, now, but we realize that we need a year to adapt and to understand different situations. Um, I hope it was clear so far. Um, if there is no other question, maybe the colleagues, the Spanish colleagues, you want me to clarify something in Spanish or if everything was clear? Seems everything was clear. Okay. Thank you, Lina. Thank you, Jorge. So uh, we are 15 uh, minutes uh, to the time. So let me take advantage to show you one quick thing, um, and then uh, we can close the, the webinar. I just wanted to just do a refresher on uh, what do we do at the global protection cluster level when you work with the protectionalist update and we do all this work on protection risks. Uh, whenever you develop a potentialized update, we publish in, uh, in, uh, in the week uh, or even in the day in social website and so on. And we made to we have a mailing list to donors and partners that I, if I recall, as, I, know, I don't want to say numbers, but at least more than 600 uh, core targets. But then what is important is that I want to just inform you that uh, we have different processes of global protection with the broad protection cluster in terms of advocacy engagement. Sometimes it's our global protection cluster community or some that has specific engagement with donor and member states. And we really have been used uh, your professionalized updates. So these are concrete examples. We have been developing, uh, we've been drafting briefing and private letter to donors. Of course, many times it's in combination with you and coordination with you, but sometimes when there are urgent situations that you have to provide a, a briefing, we use really, we use, um, the protectionist update. Uh, we wrote private letters to ambassador or to, to member state uh, members and also some statement and position. And these are examples that sometimes didn't require a huge engagement and work with you. So we really use what you already had. We just work on them, we drafted them, and of course we had a sense checking with you before publishing. And that's the goal on uh, being much more focused on protection risk because we want to reinforce the overall approach on uh, with the goal of actually reinforcing your advocacy. And that's it on my end. Um, and 
I wanted to invite you to the next webinar. It's going to be for around the third week of April. Uh, the goal is to have a session where you are actually tell, uh, telling us challenge in lessons learned and practice of this next month and a half. So it's not going to be a presentation, but more a, a session where we want uh, we, we are going to be there to address a bit challenging and also understanding if we have to change course of some of the guidance. So please try to dig in into the guidance. Come back to me or to us uh, if you have any questions or doubts. We are going to share both the recording and the guidance you already received, and I'm going to give you my email in the chat. Um, lastly, if uh, beside the webinar, if you need uh, to have specific session on specific elements, also we are available. So the idea was to do these two webinars to give you a bit more of confidence, but then we realized that if you need specific moments, we are there for, to organize them together. So on my side, it's all. Uh, if there is any last reflection, comments? Um, sorry, Francesco. So just to clarify, I heard well, it will be in the, on the third week of April. Yeah, it should be around the third week of April. I have to go okay. back to dates. Yeah, I don't remember the dates exactly. Okay, but the third sure. Week of April. Also wanted to mention that I'm not uh, receiving the emails directly to my email. I don't know. Sorry for the side note on this, but um, I can leave you my email on the chat so I could be added and my coordinator doesn't need to be forwarded me this uh, this webinars or events. Yeah. No, I have your email, so no, no, no worries. I will follow oh, up on that. Thank you, Kimberly. Any, anyways, I left it on the chat and thanks very much. It was very helpful. Pleasure. Thank you, Connie and uh, Rita. Uh, again, we this doesn't end up here. So if you need anything, I will. Uh, this is my email. I will put it in the chat. Um, and very much thank you uh, for participating and taking time to be in this webinar. And have a great rest of the week.